They say a, a good documentary tells, but uh, a, a better one shows. So uh, why don't you roll that tape? I'll just sh show a little bit about what uh, Glenda and Dean were talking about. Just, uh, just uh, watch a few minute video. I was a photographer for National Geographic magazine for almost 20 years. The first story I proposed to photograph for them was on garbage. About 15% of America saw it, enough to help start a tipping point. And recycling began to take off. It was back then that I began to see the power of imagery combined with a compelling story could help change the world. The first documentary we did, The Cove, was about the killing of dolphins in Japan. At the time, they were killing about 23,000 dolphins and porpoises a year for human consumption. That film became the most awarded documentary in history and the first doc to sweep all the film guilds. But more importantly, it created change. Because of the continued activism around that film, every year the number of dolphins killed in Japan declines. Last year, they killed 610, a 97% drop. We realized the film could work on this issue. Maybe we could scale it up to help solve one of the biggest problems of our time. The second film we made was called Racing Extinction. We're at the brink of what scientists call the Anthropocene, the sixth major extinction in the history of the planet. We're at this turning point right now where our generation is the last one that can affect the change we need to prevent a mass extinction. Racing Extinction was viewed by 36 million people in 220 countries and territories in just the first day. Through our educational campaign, 44,000 teachers showed our film to 2.5 million school children. All over America, kids began to take action in their schools and their communities. Working with organizations like the United Nations and the World Bank, we created large-scale projection events around the world and began to call attention to mass extinction at a scale way beyond anyone's imagination. We projected endangered species onto the Empire State Building, and within a week, we reached over a billion people. The issue became the top trending story on Facebook and Twitter for four days worldwide. I thought we couldn't get any more attention than that. And then the Pope called. He invited us to project onto the Vatican during COP21. He wanted to remind world leaders that more was at stake with climate change than humanity. 225,000 people saw that event live. 600 media outlets were there, and within days we reached over 4.4 billion people. The projections helped create legislation in the U.S. that banned some of the world's most endangered species from being trafficked through western ports. With the last film I directed, The Game Changers, we're turning our attention on to the biggest change people can make to save the world and themselves, what they eat. One and only, Arnold Schwarzenegger. I ate a lot of meat. They showed us commercials. Steak, that's what a man eats. Selling that idea that real men eat meat. Serious man food. But you got to understand, that's marketing. That's not based on reality. I've been teaching fighting techniques to government agencies for more than 15 years. Then, I got injured. Unable to teach for at least six months, I spent more than a thousand hours studying science on recovery and nutrition, and stumbled across a study about the Roman gladiators. The gladiators were predominantly vegetarian. How could the original professional fighters be so powerful, eating only plants? When I made the switch to a plant-based diet, I qualified for my third Olympic team. I broke two American records. I was like, man, I should have done this a long while ago. When I went plant-based, I wasn't sure if I was gonna survive. And I actually became like a machine. One of the biggest misconceptions in sports nutrition is that we have to have animal protein to perform at a high level. That's just not true. Sometimes you have to do things that you know your competitors aren't doing. Today's blood and yesterday's blood. So, I think this is going to wake a lot of people up. I was recovering better, not getting as sore. This was our best season in the last 15 years, and we had 14 guys on plant-based diets. We all want to feel great, have more energy. Cholesterol was 276. Today, 169. Whoa, now you're talking. Yeah. Most guys my age can keep up with the grandchildren. My grandchildren can't keep up with me. <laughs> it's not one set of dietary guidelines for improving your performance as an athlete. Another one for reversing heart disease, reversing diabetes. It's the same for all of them. Someone asked me, 
how could you get as strong as an ox without eating any meat? And my answer was, have you ever seen an ox eating meat? <laughs> At OPS, we're working with the world's best scientists, doctors, photographers, artists, and filmmakers to move the needle on some of the most urgent issues of our times. There's less than a dozen people that work at OPS. But like Margaret Mead once said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Please join us. Yeah, Thanks. Uh, I always tell the crew that we're, we're not making movies, we're, we're trying to start movements. Um, the fundamental difference between like what we do, making documentaries with an impact, and let's say what Hollywood directors and producers are doing is uh, they look at, at the audience and they, they look at you as butts and seats, you're $10 in a box of popcorn. I look at the audience as minds and seats, and if you can change a mind, you change somebody's world. But I was always curious, like, how do you change the world? And uh, there's a lot of great science now that shows that you only need 10% of the population to be 100% committed to an idea before you can change the world. And they did this, uh, these studies with looking at the suffragette movement, the uh, civil rights movement, and Arab Spring. And I called it the lead author. And I said, what's with 10%? Why not 6 or 7% or 17%? And he said, sent me back three pages of like algorithms, math. And I'm not a math guy. I said, called him back. I said, can you give it to me in like layman's language? You know. Uh, like, so I can understand it. He said, yeah, so it's, it's like if you're trying to create steam, you can't do it unless you get water to a boiling point. 10% of the population, 100% committed to an idea, is the tipping point for social change. And I think that's why what we do works. Um, you know, Mark Twain once said that the difference between the right word and the almost right word is the difference between the lightning and the lightning bug. I, 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 uh, we, we have great writers, we have great cinematographers, I've got a pretty, pretty good eye. Um, we assemble an all-star team and we get together and we reverse engineer what we're doing from the, the back end. How do we create social change that we needed? So that when we did the game changers, we, we thought, well, why can't people adopt a diet that they know is better for them? It's because uh, guys t t t tend to be in, in the household. They're not buying the food but in general, but they're dictating that hey, there's no meat on the plate. Um, so we had to change the male's idea of what is normal, necessary, and natural. And that's the idea of the game changer that comes out September 16th. Um, in the course of making that movie, I met uh, Dean Ornish. And I thought, OK, well, I'm, I'm not a super athlete. I want to change the world through, through food. I'm, I'm interested in saving animals and the environment. But I, I realized that if you really want to save the environment and animals, you have to save people, too. And the best way to do that is to change it with, with people's plate. And when I t uh, saw Dean lives, or works, lives and works down the street from where I do, and I thought, well, he's trying to reverse Alzheimer's. This is, I'm interested in li living a, a healthy life into, into, into old age. Dan Butner is a good friend of mine. He's the guy that was a lot of talk about the, the blue zones here. Um, you know, he's the guy that, uh, well, he didn't discover the blue zones, but he popularized it. And the blue zones, 95% of their calories come from a plant-based diet. And, um, you know, the slides up here about the, the hunter-gatherers, but 95 85% of the calories in, some, in the three primary cultures that are isolated from humanity, their calories come, most of their calories come from a plant-based diet, between 70% and 85%. Why do we call it hunter-gatherers? It should be gatherer-hunters. And it's usually the women that gather and the men that go out, and it's a social construct. We're not, we're not, you know, we, we said we're going to go out there and get the meat, we're going to go to, uh, you know, get the gazelle, but you, the men are consuming as many calories as they're bringing back to do that. So we're, we're living with this, uh, this fallacy that, you know, meat is what makes, uh, gives us energy and sustains us. It's really carbohydrates and the in plants and vegetables that keeps and maintains our, our, our health. There's talk about here about, a, you know, the antioxidant properties of red meat, if I heard that right, but... I mean, iceberg lettuce has more antioxidants than iceberg lettuce. And in general, plant-based foods have 64 times more antioxidant properties than animal-based products. So it's, uh, <laughs> if you want to change the world, you have to, you have to change what's on people's plates. So that's, um, we're, we're embedded right now with Dean's uh, study to reverse Alzheimer's. So we started it 40 weeks ago. And he can't talk about it, but I can. <laughs> because uh, it looks like it's actually working. Um, some of the early cognitive reports are coming back, and it's like, you know, between 10 and 20 percent, some of the people are doing better. It's not all assembled, but it looks like it's actually going to work. 
I'm excited by it because we're at the, at the beginning. And when you, you start these studies, um, you get 12 people around a table and they're scared. They're losing their mind. They don't want to talk. And a dean's program, and he does crazy stuff. He has them do tango dancing. He has them talking to each other. And you, and you see them coming alive over the course of 40 weeks. They're exercising, they're doing yoga, they're talking to each other. And it's really love and support. Uh, Gina was talking about you know, the, the importance of love. And that's, we don't talk about that much, but that's absolutely integral. It makes us feel alive. It's like the essence of who we are is the love and support. So I'm hoping that by bringing this film to uh, you know, millions of people, you know, potentially, uh, that we can, you know, if it's, if it's successful as I think it is, we can change the world. Um, let's see, you know, we, we spend $3.6 trillion a year on healthcare. And it's really, uh, all the doctors in this room know that that's really sick care. And 80 to 85% of that is preventable. We don't have to die of prostate cancer and breast cancer. And, and diabetes and strokes and heart disease. These are all preventable by what we put in our mouth. Um, and, you know, the raising of uh, animals for human consumption causes more direct emissions of greenhouse gases than the entire transportation sector. It's the, uh, the raising of animals for human consumption is the biggest source of, of water pollution, air pollution, habitat destruction. Uh, species extinction, and it's the biggest cost of, if, of chronic diseases. So um, I'm hoping that if we do this film and it's, and it's successful, it's going to get out there in, in a massive way. Now, we, we've been doing something quite different than most documentary, well, any filmmaker. Um, we're not interested in making money. On, we'd love to make money on a film, but we realize that if you'd sell it to Netflix, like that would be everybody, every documentary filmmaker's, oh, God, it's a Netflix. They have 130 million people that get Netflix, four person pass around, six, 700 million people have it, but they're not in China, very little in the Middle East, very little in, in India, and they don't want you to show it in schools unless it's on Netflix. So what we, our, our model is quite different. We want to uh, find, independently finance the film so that we can be, have it on Netflix. We just turned down $3 million for Game Changers uh, from, from Netflix, but we've had, a, so it's not original, but it's, uh, it'll be on Netflix, but we can still show it in schools. We can still show it at conferences if we want. We can give it away for free. And we took $225,000 as opposed to $3 million. So it just shows you that you know, we're, doing, we're doing this for altruistic reasons. We're doing this because we want to change the world, and we don't want to be wedded to somebody else's business model, because our business model is changing the world. Um, anyway, I know uh, uh, my time is about up. But uh, and I know Glenda's supporting us. If you want to talk to her about to what, uh, you know. OK. Well, anyway, thanks so much for uh, listening. I appreciate it. And uh, thanks for inviting me. Appreciate it. Cheers. Bye-bye. <laughs>